uh, let's see. So we're going to talk about linguistic knowledge in neural networks. And so since I assume most of you are not linguists, I wanted to start out by asking, uh, what is linguistics? So that we can, uh, you might kind of think, why, you know, here's an answer to why uh, this is a useful lecture as part of a deep learning course. Um, so linguistics asks, I think, these are the big scientific questions, at least uh, my take on linguistics. Is, this is what they're interested in. Um, how do human languages represent meaning? Uh, how does the mind or brain process and generate language? Um, what are the possible and impossible human languages? Uh, and especially, how do children learn language from a very small sample of data? So you can see that linguists are really interested fundamentally in questions of learnability and representation that intersect very strongly with the topic of uh, you know, machine learning broadly um, and the uh, specific focus of this course. And uh, they've actually, they're smart people, some of them, and uh, have got, had some really important insights that we can possibly leverage uh, both to improve our models and also to uh, uh, understand what they're doing and maybe uh, not doing. So um, I'm going to start out with kind of a motivating example here. Uh, uh, I'm going to imagine you're a learner and you're confronted with uh, this sentence. Uh, the talk I gave did not appeal to anybody. Um, and uh, you have also, you're given the uh, information that if you say the talk I gave appealed to anybody, that's an ungrammatical sentence. So that's what that little star uh, up there means. So um, we might hypothesize that uh, what's going on here is there's this uh, not, there's this relationship between not and anybody, and not is basically saying that anybody can come later. So this is what's called a, a negative polarity item licensor, and so you have uh, basically this negative element not that licenses anybody. It could be some other negative element like hardly or no, or things like that. Um, <clears throat> so a learner might generalize, say an RNN, uh, might generalize that not has to come before anybody, otherwise, you know, the probability of anybody should be really low. Um, but then we might think that this sentence has a high probability. The talk I did not give appealed to anybody. And native speakers of English and probably most of the non-natives in this room will also say, well, that's a little funny. Um, and so we might say, well, what's actually going on here? Um, so it turns out linguists have looked at this and come up with uh, theories of uh, what sentences are grammatical and make sense and can be interpreted, uh, and which ones can't be. And they figured out that uh, sentences are organized into hierarchical tree structured units, or maybe graph structured, but they look mostly like trees. Uh, and the, this relationship between negative polarity items and the things they license uh, is a particular structural configuration that can be expressed in this kind of who's your uncle in the tree. Uh, configuration, which linguists confusingly call C command. Um, and so you can see in these two diagrams of the sentence, it's not that not comes just before anybody, it has to exist in this particular kind of uh, I'm your uncle relationship, which it doesn't hold on the right hand tree. Um, so the correct generalization, it turns out, is that not must structurally precede anybody. Um, so, um, just as a means of introduction here, I want to say that the psychological reality of structural sensitivity is not empirically controversial at this point. Um, there, however, are lots of theories about the specifics of what this structure looks like and how it's encoded. Uh, and that's what linguists uh, work on. Um, you will, outside of linguistics, sometimes people, sometimes find people disputing this, but this is sort of like going outside of climate science and finding people that dispute global warming. Um, it's just, if you know anything about the subject area, it's not controversial. Um, so, um, an interesting hypothesis, though, is that, um, so we saw this example of learnability where uh, we're presented, say, with these two data points, and we might conclude the wrong thing. Um, there's a further hypothesis that's been advanced by people like Noam Chomsky um, that say that one of the reasons kids are able to learn language so quickly is because they never consider the wrong hypothesis. From day one, the way they're computing mental representations of language is in terms of structure. And so they know that they can't even sort of represent the hypothesis that 
just sequentially precedes is a valid rule in their language. They're always thinking about uh, language in terms of structure. Um, and so basically, uh, th and this isn't uh, partially, and the degree to which this is a sort of interesting and meaningful hypothesis is an open question, uh, but uh, these ideas for, by changing the hypothesis class, we might change learnability is a really important idea. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about some of the ways we might change our hypothesis class uh, in this core, uh, in the neural networks we're building to get better linguistic generalization. So um, let's go back to recurrent neural network models because those have been our workhorses really this whole semester. We use variants of them, you know, LSTMs and things like that uh, for almost everything we've talked about. Um, and so we can ask, are these you know, adequate models to capture uh, these structural sorts of generalizations that we just talked about. Um, and uh, in fact, yes, they, they are certainly. Uh, you can show that RNNs are capable, given enough capacity at least, of uh, computing any function. Uh, they're Turing complete. Uh, this can be proven. Um, and so, yes, obviously, uh, any, you know, Turing machine compute, can compute anything computable. So we're done, right? That's not the end of the story, though. The real question is, do they make good generalizations from finite samples of data? So this gets us back to a different set of questions. So what inductive biases do they have? And what assumptions about representations do models that use them make? So the question here, I will say, is if you have enough data, RNNs will eventually give you the right answer, I think is one thing we can, uh, we can hopefully conclude from this. I mean, modular difficulties with vanishing gradients and optimizer instability and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but in general, if we have enough data. However, we never have enough data. If you're working on a problem like machine translation, okay, maybe you've got enough data, you can work with some fairly naive models. But if you start working on, say, dialogue generation, you're gonna have trouble finding enough examples in that domain when, you know, uh, the widget corporation calls you up and said, I need a dialogue system tomorrow for uh, our new call center, uh, they're going to be unhappy with uh, what an RNN learns uh, from a binary sample. So sample complexity, uh, which is the quant, you know, which is a way of quantifying how much data we need to learn a good model that generalizes well, is super important. And so uh, this, this is, uh, it's not enough to just say, yes, RNNs in theory could compute it. We want to know how quickly. Okay, so let's talk about inductive bias in neural networks or RNNs a little bit. So first thing I'll say is understanding the biases of neural networks uh, is tricky. Um, we have enough trouble understanding the representations that they learn that, that they've learned in specific cases from specific samples of data. Um, and inductive bias basically is saying what do they learn in general from data in general. Um, so characterizing that is a, just a fundamentally hard problem. We don't really have the tools developed yet to do that. Um, but there is, however, a lot of evidence that RNNs prefer sequential recency. So if there, if there are two things in the data that can be explained, they're going to look and prefer ascribing uh, a cause to something in the recent past rather than something in the more distant past uh, to, um, uh, as, as, an expl as the explanation they use to uh, model some, uh, some observation. Well, we have three bits of evidence for this, I think. Uh, so first is we can show formally that gradients become attenuated across time. Phil covered that in the vanishing gradient lecture. Um, yes, LSTMs do help, but there are still limits. Um, we also see we've converged on some practical tricks that help us uh, deal with this or exploit this fact. So we reverse sequences and sequence to sequence learning, which puts some of the dependencies quite close together sequentially, which we think is, uh, which is one explanation for why they work. Um, and the third bit of evidence is we add things to our model that create more direct connections that skip over parts of the sequence. So we have uh, attention and gating mechanisms that let us uh, have direct connections back remotely in time rather than assuming that the uh, model will just be able to remember everything in, in sequence. Um, so yeah, I think uh, there is basically a lot of evidence that sequential recency is the inductive bias present uh, in RNNs. 
And if we are to paraphrase what Noam Chomsky has said in roughly 60 years of work on uh, human language, um, it is that sequential recency is not the right bias for effective learning of human language. If you use that as your bias, you're going to make all sorts of wrong generalizations that you don't, in fact, see kids making from their data. So, Yes, given enough data, we might get away from these wrong generalizations, but if we care about good sample complexity, we want to get these biases right. All right, so this is uh, kind of the, the high-level introduction uh, with a kind of concrete example. Now I'm going to talk about the four topics we'll discuss in some detail uh, that uh, maybe use linguistic insights to come up with better architectures for uh, modeling language. Uh, so the first is recursive neural networks for uh, computing sentence representations. Uh, the second is uh, parsing and uh, generating language, so language modeling, using a grammar-based formalism. So one that rather than using sequential recency uses the structural configurations that, that I showed, or some approximation to those. Um, then we can also do this uh, at the word level. So words like sentences have internal structure. So if you think about a word like unionize, it's maybe put together of a couple of morphemes, union and eyes. Uh, other languages than English have much more interesting morphological processes. Uh, and so we can think about computing representations of words by looking at the uh, parts of the words. Um, and then finally, we'll look at things kind of the other way around. We'll say, well, RNNs are actually pretty good at modeling language. What is it that they're learning uh, about uh, language just without being told about the internal structure? Are they making the right generalizations? Okay, <clears throat> so let's go back to uh, the task of representing a sentence as a vector. So this is basically what you started in practical one. Uh, you are representing documents there. Uh, you can do the same thing with just sentences. So imagine our task is to take a sentence uh, and say these are from movie reviews and classify the sentence as being positive or negative towards the movie. So sentiment classification. Um, this, is, or this is actually really uh, an important application. So this film is hardly a treat. Um, so can somebody tell me why this sentence, why I picked this sentence? Yeah. Is from a backwards standpoint, looks positive. Yeah, you know. There's nothing really in that sentence that jumps out as, as, as overly negative. But I think we'd all agree that's not a really positive sentence, right? Um, okay, so basically what's going on here is hardly is a kind of ne it's a negative element and it's negating a treat, which is a positive thing. So, you know, we'd like, we've got some computation that needs to be there. So right, if we throw this into our bag of words model, um, we wouldn't expect this. Maybe it would come out slightly negative, maybe not. I don't know, I didn't run it. Um, what do we think about this? Do you think this would work? Depends on how many times it is. Yeah, I think it might, probably would. I was hoping it would actually have the answer for you in this lecture. It turns out the guy who wrote these papers didn't actually compare it to this model, which I only embarrassed embarrassingly was reminded of last night while I was writing these slides. Um, I think it probably would work. But here is a linguistic approach to building a sentence representation. So it starts from this idea, uh, which is usually ascribed to Gottlob Frege, who's a philosopher of language at the end of the 19th century called the principle of compositionality. Although I just read on Wikipedia that he didn't actually articulate this and it's, you know, Aristotle or somebody, sort of everyone else but Frege has mentioned this. Um, it just says that the meaning of a complex expression is determined by the meanings of the sub-expressions and the rules that combine them. So you can think about arithmetic expressions. You've got a long thing with lots of parentheses and operations. And then you know, we know the meaning of each of the operations. We know the meaning of each of the numbers. And by looking at how they fit together, we can evaluate the whole value of the expression. So um, from a linguistic perspective, uh, this relates to uh, syntax and parsing. So syntax is the study of how words fit together to form phrases and ultimately sentences. So those trees that I was drawing, that's a theory of syntax. And so all theories of syntax 
have, you know, they define sort of a set of uh, structures and representations like trees uh, and have ideas for how they're built and put together. Um, and syntactic parsing is the problem of decomposing a particular sentence into the structures that underlie uh, it and, uh, you know, knowing what rules apply and things like that. Uh, and so we can use syntactic parsing to decompose that sentence into a particular tree structure and then the idea is that the meaning should be in some sense transparent to the meaning. The way the meaning is computed by the sentence should be transparent in that structure, much the way when we have an expression tree, we can evaluate internal nodes uh, recursively to compute and, uh, a result for the uh, full value of the expression. So here's a parse of this sentence. Uh, and this probably isn't a great parse. This is actually the parse that uh, came out of the parser I ran this on. I think it's wrong, um, but I didn't, uh, I didn't change it. Um, so uh, basically what it says is that um, we've got the whole value of the sentence, which is an S, and S decomposes uh, into two elements, a noun phrase, that's what that NP stands for, and a VP, a verb phrase. Uh, and the noun phrase is, uh, this film, and then the VP is the rest of the sentence. And then that VP internally decomposes into a verb is, and then hardly a treat. And hardly is a modifier that takes this NP in this case, uh, and is presumably going to do something. And then finally we've got another NP, which is a treat. And so the idea in a recursive neural net is we're going to compute representations for each of these nodes, sort of in the way that a recurrent neural network goes from left to right and just composes things recursively with everything that came before. We're going to do this in this bottom-up way. So it's a really, really basic idea. Um, so right, we'll first say build a representation uh, for this NP, just looking at those two pieces. And then we'll build a representation for this NP. We'll go up uh, propagating up the tree, just like you'd evaluate uh, an expression tree. So um, this work is due to, um, well, most of this idea actually has been proposed a few times uh, in the history of neural networks. It came, uh, there were some early tree structured neural networks in the 1990s. Uh, it came back fairly recently and now I think has kind of some staying power with the work of Richard Socher starting with a paper at ICML uh, in 2011 and then also in a series uh, of papers. And so uh, the idea is, the model is really simple. We're basically going to, at each of these nodes, we're going to compute uh, a hidden activation uh, as a um, affine transformation whose input is the a concatenation of the uh, left child and the right child, um, and then we'll pass it through a nonlinearity, which tan H or something like that. And then we're going to do this. We're going to proceed up the tree recursively until we compute a representation for the root node. Now, in this original work, uh, we assumed these were binary trees. This is uh, a not unreasonable linguistic assumption, um, but there are many other formalisms that let you have multiple children. The generalizations to multiple children is fairly straightforward. Um, you can also do things in subsequent papers. Uh, <coughs> it was proposed to use the information about what these internal uh, node types are. So you might think that uh, the way a verb combines with its uh, argument, its object, is a little bit different than the way, say, a noun phrase combines uh, with an adjectival modifier. Uh, and so you can uh, annotate these composition functions, or you can reparameterize these composition functions in a variety of ways. One possible way is to just uh, change the uh, weight matrix depending on the resulting type uh, of the composition. Uh, so you've got an NP compo uh, composition matrix, uh, and then a VP1, and then an S1. Um, you, could, you can develop a whole bunch of different uh, things here, and this can, this can be helpful uh, in certain tasks. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's syntactic on time. Um, so, in the end, though, what we're left with is a representation of the sentence, a single vector representation, uh, and we can back propagate through that and learn all of those W's 
uh, and ultimately the word embeddings uh, by backpropagating an error signal. So if we're doing sentiment classification, all we need is some sentiment labeled uh, data uh, and we can, uh, we can learn these things. Um, so this is just like any of the other models uh, for sentence representation that we've, uh, that we've talked about so far uh, this course. Um, but you can do uh, a few more interesting things. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about a data set. We haven't talked too much about data sets, I think, in this course, but uh, uh, they're obviously an important part of what we do in machine learning. Um, so um, this work uh, led to the creation of something called the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, where they went through uh, uh, and annotated a bunch of uh, sentences from a corpus of movie reviews. That's why I picked that uh, sort of movie reviewish sentence at the beginning. Uh, but rather than just annotating the entire sentence to say, is this positive or negative, they actually parsed the sentence and took every subconstituent and asked the annotator to say, is this sequence of words uh, positive, negative, neutral, or very uh, positive or negative? Uh, and um, syntactic constituents have this appealing property uh, one of the diagnostics that linguists use when they decide what a constituent is, uh, is basically, can it stand on its own to a certain extent? So one thing you can say is, would this sequence of words make a appealing uh, movie title? So you'll have a noun phrase as a movie title, but you wouldn't have something that's not a phrase like and the. Uh. That's a perfectly valid bigram in English, but it's not a constituent. It doesn't really have a, have a meaning. Now, this isn't perfect. You're not going to get sort of sensible sequences of words. Certainly, and parsers make mistakes. But by and large, you can pick out any spam that's dominated by one of these nodes, and it's a reasonable sentence of English. And as you get higher, higher and higher in the tree, uh, you'll get more and more uh, sort of interpretable chunks. Um, and one of the things you see in this is you get these negation kinds of things where you'll have some negation doesn't care uh, and then everything under there is roughly positive and then once you negate it then the whole sentence is uh, you've applied negation to kind of everything inside of this. So you can see really that meaning in some sense is recursively computed uh, or sentiment is somehow recursively uh, computed. Uh, rather than, say, having a more bag of words assumption. You could imagine a world where kind of different spans have, you know, kind of positive and negative results, and then you just kind of average uh, at the end, and that's sort of a good model of cognition. It actually looks like there is something recursive about the way we compute uh, sentiment. So one of the things that this lets you do is provide internal supervision on these uh, recursive neural networks, which is kind of interesting. So when you're going through and computing these hidden vector representations, and I apologize for the switch in notation, I took this figure from a uh, written paper rather than making it new. Uh, you basically, uh, you're going to use that obviously to compute the values of subsequent uh, nodes in the tree, but you're also going to run a classifier that's going to predict, using that representation, whether that node is positive uh, or negative. And so this is going to be useful because then every node, you're going to be able to ask this classifier, do you think everything under you is positive or negative? So you can, on one hand, you can interpret what the tree is doing, and on the other hand, um, you've got maybe some extra supervisory uh, signal, which is kind of nice. Um, OK, so here are some results. Um, basically. Uh, a naive Bayes bigram model gets 83% accuracy on that. It's kind of kind of sad. It's, or it's kind of you know quite good compared to this fancy model, which gets 85.4%. Right? That's and in fact that wasn't even just the model that I presented. Uh, this is this fancier version of things where you take an outer product between the concatenation of the children vectors, so you then get this big squared matrix, and then you line it up in a big vector, and then you multiply that, so you've got these kind of multiplicative interactions between all components of the vectors, and they become more features. And uh, so if you set V to zero, you, reco you recover uh, the original model, so it's like a more powerful model with way more parameters. So clearly they were striving. but What's interesting is if you look at specific phenomena. So um, some of the cases where we think uh, interesting things are going on with 
recursive computation involve things like negation. And semanticists, the people who study you know, how languages mean things, have identified that not bad doesn't mean the same thing as good. Um, and especially since I moved to England, like I figured out that there are all sorts of subtleties and uh, you know what uh, what these things mean. You know, not bad really is not good. Um, so uh, they found that uh, this model is much better at uh, at capturing these negations of positive uh, sentiment tree structures uh, and negative sentiment tree structures. So they went through and they actually annotated in their test set every time there was a negation uh, what the sentiment of the thing being negated was. And then they looked specifically at the accuracy on those. And so you can see that when we negate a positive, the, the, bi, uh, the bigram model just couldn't deal with this at all. Uh, it was only getting 19% uh, accuracy. That's you know terrible. In fact, I don't know why it's so far away from chance. Yeah? Um, does that mean that it's doing really badly on other things? No, these are just, uh, there just aren't a huge number of these things is all. Um, these make up a very small proportion. That's a good question. Um, they didn't, uh, actually, I didn't actually look at that. I don't think so, but my guess is this is just a very small proportion. Yeah. Sorry, sorry what, what was this? The, that the, so if you have the, the tree structure of your sentence, then the one possible one and access the sentence of the subtree of your sentence, right? This was trained just supervision at the root node. Oh. Um, right. Yeah, no, that's a, they, so they, it was presented with the exact same uh, information in this. Any other questions about this? OK, so this is a you know, nice, nice result. I remember sitting in the audience when I heard this. I was like, man, it's one of those ideas I wish I um, so one of the other cool things you can do is look at the predictions made by this model. And um, you can see that, uh, so here he's manipulated the sentence. So Roger Dodger is one of the most compelling variations on this theme, and then just change it to least compelling. And uh, you see, you know, both cases compelling is a positive word, uh, but then uh, that least negates it, and then just everything propagates up. Uh, and sort of everything else, uh, as it combines with these neutral elements, it just stays with whatever sentiment uh, is, is left over. Um, so, you know, this is nice. You can actually look inside the model and reason about what's, what's going on here. So this, um, these are recursive uh, neural networks. Um, there have been um, various extensions to this. Um, so you can change the cell definition. Um, people have done Instead of representing words and uh, internal nodes as vectors, you can represent them as pairs of matrices and vectors. This gives you a little bit of a notion of kind of function application, which seems to be a good characterization of a lot of semantic processes. Um, we do have some problems with gradient propagation. So uh, trees uh, do have, uh, a, they aren't as long as sequences, but they still can be fairly long in terms of problems with vanishing gradients. So you can generalize the definition of the cell to look a little bit more uh, like an LSTM, where you have information that's propagated through gates. Um, I'll leave it as an exercise to you to uh, generalize the definition of a sequential definition to the tree case. So basically, rather than having one input at every time step, you've got uh, two inputs. Figure out how to do that, and then see if you came up with the same solution as uh, the people who uh, wrote the paper on this. Um, you can deal with multiple children. Um, there are some analogs to bidirectional RNNs, so uh, we saw several times about being able to look at a sequence both from the left and then from the right, and then at every word you can say, well, now I've got a representation that, incur that represents that word, but in its complete sentential context. You can do the same thing uh, with trees, where you define a top-down propagation uh, process. Um, there, we'll talk about dependency syntax in a little bit. So rather than having these phrases, you can just say that words uh, are the only thing in the sentence, but they uh, depend on each other rather than in a sequential order in a tree-like structure. Uh, these have been uh, generalized. Um, and there have been applications to other domains in the natural language. 
Uh, so programming languages also have beautiful tree structured uh, representations. And in fact, the great thing about programming languages is it's actually not usually deterministic. If you give somebody a sentence in a programming language, the programming language's parser gives you exactly one tree back and you know it's the right tree. Um, and so you can do interesting modeling uh, of that. Um, you can also decompose visual scenes in terms of trees. And uh, actually the original uh, paper did uh, an analysis of uh, scene contents using recursive networks. Um, so these are, these are really uh, quite powerful. Um, so comparing these with uh, recurrent neural networks, um, basically um, meaning decomposes roughly according to the syntax of a sentence. And we have really good tools for getting uh, the syntax of trees. And I'll talk about how we do that in just a second. Um, so we do get shorter paths on average. Um, and sometimes we can get internal supervision uh, of the node representations. So we can generate either the, uh, some proxy for the final reward or the final task at each internal node, um, or we can generate something else um, internally to the tree. Um, the disadvantages are, well, first and foremost, we need parse trees, and you don't always necessarily have an easy way of getting those things. Um, and since trees tend to be right branching anyway, gradients often have a long way to travel, so that benefit of that theoretical log uh, reduction in, in path length goes away. Um, and then finally, uh, implementing these things can be uh, a lot more painful, so especially if you want to batch them up on GPU hardware. And there isn't really still a really nice solution to this problem. Uh, people are exploring different programming models for dealing with this. Yeah? That is pretty good. Um, you still have to write the batching logic yourself, and um, it becomes not the sort of logic that you... So when, Pat, when we're building batches of sequences, we know we have to deal with the case when sequences are of different lengths. And we do that with masking and padding. Um, when we're doing, dealing with this, it's much more complicated to come up with the uh, thing. And there are solutions. It's just, it, as these models become more and more complicated, um, it's not the kind of thing that a human programmer should be doing. Uh, it's the kind of thing that toolkits should be doing. And we're trying to figure out how to get toolkits to automate this process. I mean, it's like a compiler. Yes, you can write assembly language by hand, but you shouldn't be spending your time doing this. We're just at the day, we're still in the era right now where compilers don't do what they're supposed to because we haven't written them yet, but we will one day. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about where trees come from. I found this, uh, this very stupid tree. <clears throat> So I'm going to go back to this language modeling problem that we started with and talk about an alternative to RNN language models, which we're going to use to uh, parse sentences uh, into trees um, uh, at the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate sentences uh, by symbolically, ge or sequentially generating symbols using an RNN. So it's just a straight up RNN language model. But then we're going to add some control symbols that are periodically going to rewrite the history of that RNN. So it's basically going to, you're going to spit out a bunch of words, and then it's going to say, oh, I think these last 10 words I generated were actually just one syntactic constituent, and I'm going to compress them down to a single vector. Um, and so the, we're going to do this with some extra, basically, parentheses that are going to be predicted by this RNN. And then there's going to be a little bit of logic that's going to interpret uh, how those control symbols uh, are used. I'll go through what this looks like. Um, so basically, what we're going to end up with is we're going to generate trees in a top-down, left-to-right generation. Uh, and this is nice because these trees have exactly one top down, left to right ordering, so there's no ambiguity about how you might generate a tree once you know what the tree is. Um, so we're going to be assuming for now in this lecture that we know what the trees are, and there are things out there in the universe called tree banks where linguists sat down and they argued with each other and then finally converged on an answer about this is what the tree uh, for the sentences, or at least as uh, it is in the and tree bank or whatever tree bank you're looking at. So here's an example of derivation of the sentence, the hungry cat 
uh, meows loudly. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to have one data structure, which is I'm going to call the stack. And we're going to have some actions. And these are going to be either the words we're going to predict or these special control symbols. And I'm grouping the two, those two things together into this ge generic term action. So for those of you who are familiar with reinforcement learning, you can think about this as kind of the actions in your, in your state space. And then we've got a probability of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by with an action called non-terminal. And this is going to basically start uh, a new non-terminal, and it's going to be an S. And we're going to condition this just on the fact that we're starting out the tree. So the stack then is going to have this open parentheses S uh, on, on its top. Um, then we can generate uh, another NT uh, non-terminal action that has a uh, further specified by a noun phrase. Uh, and then the stack looks like this. And then we're going to generate a word. Um, and when we generate, uh, when we decide what the probability of each of these actions are, we're going to use an RNN to remember, ever, to look at everything that's happened in the past. So we're going to use the chain rule to, to decompose these things. Um, and then the stack is going to look like this. So now we've got this open parentheses S, open parentheses NP, and then the. And this is, should start looking like a, a S expression uh, version of a tree, which uh, those of you who have worked with uh, well, natural language parsers will be familiar with it. Those of you who programmed in Lisp should also be familiar with. Um, then we'll generate hungry and then cat. Um, and now we've got this NP, the hungry cat. So these are five elements on our stack. Now the interesting thing happens. Now we're going to have a special action called reduce, which is basically going to close this NP parenthesis off. And now we're going to execute a little bit of special code. So rather than just having this sequence of terminals and non-terminals on the stack, what we're going to do is we're going to replace that most recent constituent with a single compressed representation. We're going to compose that into a single vector and replace and pop all of those things off of the stack and push that, that NP representing that whole constituent onto the stack as a single symbol. So this is what we're left with after the reduce operation. And then we'll continue and generate uh, until we have just a single uh, element left on the stack. And so the sequence of all these probabilities, which is just justified by the chain rule, so that's going to define the product of generating this particular sequence of words with this particular uh, tree structure. Um, and this is a really powerful concept. So if you're building a big uh, complex structure, if you break it down into a sequence of discrete actions, uh, you can always use this trick to define the probability distribution over all of the possible such sequences uh, that you can, you can uh, in, in the space. So some things that um, you can uh, say about this. Um, so every, uh, there is exactly one sequence of actions for every valid tree, uh, so you don't have to worry about marginalizing or anything uh, like that or any invalid sequences uh, of actions. Um, the other thing you can uh, fairly easily see is that every stack configuration perfectly encodes the complete history of actions. So all we've got to look at at every time step to compute the representation of what ap action we should take next is the current stack configuration. This is going to be important in a second. Um, and so therefore, the probability decomposition that we use uh, for the sequence, uh, for the joint probability of the sequence of words x and the tree y is just the probability of the sequence of actions that it takes uh, to build uh, such a thing. Um, and then we can represent the history of all actions by the current stack configuration at any, uh, at any time. And those things are, these all follow um, with equality. Okay, so how do we model the next action in this recurrent neural network grammar? So imagine this is our uh, stack configuration here, and we want to define our action. And remember, so our actions are going to consist of uh, well, these non-terminal actions and that reduce action and then all of the possible words in the language. So it's a pretty big action space, but you know, nothing, nothing a big softmax. 
Um, so one of the things to note is, well, the stack can have unbounded depth. You can always have you know, a longer sentence that's got to get deeper and deeper. Um, so whenever we have unbounded long, unboundedly long things, a good answer is, well, recurrent neural networks are great. Yeah, you can use continents or something like that, or you can use arguments. Um, the second thing to note is we can have arbitrarily complex trees on this stack. So right here, we've just got one little constituent, but there could be trees nested inside of it. Um, and so that suggests, well, um, for modeling the internal uh, structure of these, uh, of these nested structures, maybe we should use recursive neural networks. We just saw how to do that. You know, we just backpropagate down through this. Um, so I'm going to use a slight variant here for uh, uh, recursive neural networks. This should just give you some idea of the kind of flexibility you have in defining these cells. Um, so uh, we can use RNNs actually to define the cell composition here. So if we want to generate a representation for this constituent NP, the hunger cat, we can do it by start feeding an NP, an embedding of the NP symbol into an RNN, reading that phrase from left to right, and then doing the same thing from right to left. Um, so we'll again start with an NP on the right-hand side and go and uh, build two representations, one from the left and one from the right. By combining those two into a single vector, uh, we get an embedding. Um, as long as the dimensionality of each of these words and the output of this process is the same, we can recursively stack these things. So if we had something like the very hungry cat, well, very hungry edge p is just going to be represented by some vector, and so we can substitute that in there. And you can see how we'll just, when we train these things, we're going to instantiate this neural network, and we're going to be able to backpropagate through this massive tree structured graph with lots of nested recursive, uh, recurrent neural networks, things like that. So this is another way of dealing with, um, with uh, recursive neural networks. Um, in this work, uh, it's a little bit necessary to generalize beyond that simple by uh, sort of binary uh, composition function that the original uh, tree RNNs uh, had done. So this should give you some idea of what's possible. Um, okay, so unbounded depth, arbitrarily complex trees we've dealt with. The third thing is um, to note, um, if we now predict that we're going to reduce, uh, say, a reduce action, we are going to change this uh, structure um, in some somewhat small and controlled way. So rather than... Uh, at every subsequent time step, having a completely different configuration of the stack, we're basically going to be just pushing and popping things off the end of the stack. And so we probably don't want to recompute that RNN from left to right and do more work than we, than we have to. We want to cache some of these uh, intermediate representations. So um, here, for example, if we executed this reduce, you'll see that a lot of the stack from time step one to time step two is the same. And so we don't want to waste any effort. Um, and so we're going to have limited updates on the stack. And so we're going to use something called a stack RNN. These are somewhat similar to the uh, stack RNNs, that are to the stack memories that uh, Ed talked about uh, last week. Uh, on Thursday's lecture, um, except rather than having a continuous value for push and pop, we're just going to have a binary value that says I'm pushing or I'm popping. And so that's going to simplify things on one hand, but it's going to make learning those things in an unsupervised way a lot harder. So we're going to assume, though, that we're told what the sequence of actions is because somebody has bothered to annotate the trees uh, for us. Yeah. They are hard. Yes, they are hard pushes in the sense that you are actually, you know, it's just like a uh, stack that you saw in, you know, your intro to algorithms uh, course. And basically, so let me describe. I think it'll become a little bit more clear what these stack RNNs uh, do. So basically, what we're going to do to define the stack RNN is we're going to augment an RNN with a stack pointer, and we're going to have two constant time operations: push which is basically just like an RNN, going to add one more symbol onto the end 
of that RNN and compute a new hidden re representation. Um, and it's going to then move the stack pointer to that position. And then pop is going to move the stack pointer back to whatever its previous parent was. And so at every time step, you can say, what is the current configuration of the stack going to look like? And the way to think about this is the stack summary is going to be if you had started over from scratch and ran an RNN on it from left to right through the stack, you would get the, uh, so you would, and then encoded all of the elements currently on the stack, that would be the summary that uh, you're computing. This is just a way of representing the stack um, so that you don't have to run that uh, RNN from scratch every single time. Uh, because that would be quadratic in the limit. And if you do this, you can get it down to, uh, that would, well, processing a stack would be linear. I mean, these are all constant time operations. Um, okay, so here's what this looks like. So we start off with uh, an empty stack where we've got some dummy symbol uh, on the stack. This is like your, your start symbol. And the stack pointer is pointing, and if you dereference the stack, you get this y not vector. If you push something onto the stack, um, you now have uh, things at this. Uh, you've now pushed x1 onto the stack. The summary is y1. Now, if you pop, you don't get rid of that thing. Normally, we would destroy the top element of the stack. But this is sometimes also called a non-destructible non stack. This actually comes up in non-neural network applications. But we're going to leave this guy around because we might have error signals impinging on that y1. So we need to keep it around because when we do back propagation through the graph, we need to still be able to refer to the value that we computed at y1. So now if we push again, we're going to push x2 onto this. We're going to, rather than, uh, we're going to put the x2 on the far right of this RNN. But the recurrent connection, rather than going to the uh, rightmost element, is going to go where the stack pointer previously was. So that's why we get this kind of loopy uh, looking thing. And now if we pop, we're going to go back. We're going to follow that recurrent connection to its parent. Uh, and then that's going to be the new configuration. So if we push again, we're going to end up building something like this. And you should notice that this configuration of lines down here in the, in the recurrent connection starts to look an awful lot like a, a tree, um, for those of you who have seen dependency trees uh, like that. So this builds, uh, basically, through a sequence of push and pop operations, you get all the different possible trees. And you can actually show that uh, any possible, what they call uh, projective tree, uh, can be constructed using the sequence of push and pop operations. Is this, is this kind of clear? All right. Um, so these are the three pieces that come together to compute the representation that we need to use at every time step to predict the next action in the RNNG. And an RNNG is just this model uh, with a recursive neural network and then the stack RNN predicting this particular sequence of actions. Um, so let's uh, go back to the question we started this lecture with, which is what is the deal with the inductive bias in these models? So um, I think we can say if we accept the following two propositions, the first, RNNs have a recency bias. Um, and second, that syntactic composition learns to represent trees by their heads. Um, so basically, uh, what a head is in linguistics is uh, if you have a expression that uh, consists of multiple words, like flagpole, um, is that more like a flag or is it more like a pole? Um, that kind of notion of the more salient element is, uh, uh, is the head. And there are some more uh, specific diagnostics that some dietitians like to, like to talk about. Um, I think if we say these two things, then we can say we do get syntactic recency. Yes? Um, Uh, no, these are syntacticians work by introspection. They, they you know, ask themselves, like, um, so there, one of the things you can do is you can say, would the sentence continue to make sense if you substituted the entire phrase with just its head? So if you're saying something about the flagpole, you can say, you know, the flagpole um, is tall and 
you know, stands next to the university. Would it still make sense if you said the flag is tall and stands next to the university, or the pole is tall and stands next to the university? And then the linguist would sort of say, hmm, I think the second one sounds better. And that would be, they have, they have literally hundreds of diagnostics for headedness. And uh, you, know, you can go over to like Walton Road and talk to, talk to the guys over there. Uh, actually, do we have any linguists uh, in today's lecture? Uh, nobody has come. Um, uh, there, there are. I mean, I, I don't really know very much about the, about these things, but uh, there is a whole field of study for what are the constituents, what are their heads. Does he, are there, is there always one head, or sometimes maybe are there multiple heads? So there's some more complicated uh, expressions like comparatives and things like that, where it's kind of hard to decide. Um, and there's actually huge arguments about sort of what their appropriate heads are. Um, so. Um, but at any rate, I think if we can say that these two things are true, basically what this is saying is that each word in some phrase is going to be represented by a head, and that head is going to either be the head of something near the, uh, of one of the embedded phrases, or it's going to be the head of something, uh, you know, it can be sort of anywhere uh, in, that, in that structure. Um, we can see then, so going back to the example I started with where we said the talk I did not give appealed to anybody, you know, that's a bad sentence. But that's basically this model is going to roughly represent this whole phrase with something like an approximation of the word talk. Because talk is the head of this, the talk I did not give according to this parse of the sentence. Um, and so, yes, it's true that there will be some residue of the word not in there. But a priori, the model is going to be encouraged to have forgotten the, the details of what happened inside of that syntactic constituent. Um, and so there is good evidence that uh, you know, this is changing the inductive bias. And so these are the kinds of things you can do to a model uh, to encourage it to make better, uh, better generalizations. So this is, I don't claim to be a, a perfect model. So by the way, this is my work. Um, so I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, this is why I'm giving this talk here at the end. Um, because uh, uh, well, linguistics is kind of an uh, unusual topic in deep learning. But uh, um, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've done this stuff. So um, I don't claim this is a perfect model. But I do think uh, you know, potentially it's a better model um, for for language than just uh, naive r nets. Um, OK, let's talk a little bit about estimation. Um, so we have two ways of estimating the parameters of this model. So the first is generative. So we go to our tree bank, and I showed you those sequences of actions. We can build those for any tree. And we have a model. We just predict the cross entropy relative to that sequence of actions uh, and, uh, and back propagate the cross entropy loss. Um, this is going to build a joint probability distribution x and y. Uh, so uh, that's we're jointly building the tree and the sentence. Um, and then to parse, so if we want to, given a sentence, find me the most likely, um, uh, likely tree, uh, we're going to need to execute this uh, probabilistic inference problem. Uh, and this is non-trivial, uh, and I'm not really going to uh, talk about it just to say that you can uh, you can't do this exactly, but you can approximate it. Um, you can also train this model uh, discriminatively. So in that case, you no longer have a language model. You're not jointly generating uh, strings of sentence of strings of words and parse structures. What you're doing is you are, in some sense, consuming the words of the sentence that's given to you, and you're building a parse structure to account for that. Um, so basically, the only change to the actions that we make is instead of having a generation action that decides what the next word is going to be, we're going to have a shift operation which is going to consume the next word. And then when we condition, when we decide what action to take, we're also going to be looking at what are the words in the sentence that I'm, uh, that I'm still reading that I haven't parsed yet. So we can, use a, we can use an RNN for that because the sentence can be of an unbounded length. Um, and so in that case, we'll call this a conditional distribution, uh, Q of Y, uh, given X. Um, and then here, parsing becomes really easy. We can just use beam search to find the best sequence. So we talked about that in the lesson, uh, the uh, lecture on conditional language model. 
In fact, you can think about this just as a funny kind of conditional language model, where we're modeling a sequence in the action language of, uh, of these actions conditional on uh, a sentence. So we're translating a sequence of words into the sequence of actions. Um, OK, so a couple of uh, sets of results. Uh, this works really well. Parsing is a uh, long-standing task in natural language processing. Uh, this is um, uh, on the English Wall Street Journal uh, Penn Tree Bank. So when we sat down and grew up these tree structures, we look at how well we can predict them. Um, this is basically F measure on the number of constituents that you got right. So we're getting, uh, we're up to nearly 94% on this. Um, and uh, now we're actually even closer to 94%. Um, and one thing to note is we had two models, one generative and one discriminative. Uh, the discriminative model is actually a little bit worse. Um, and so this is, uh, we don't often think of neural networks as generative models, but uh, they uh, can actually be quite good ones. So um, I think this is a really interesting question why it's, why it's doing so well here. Um, we can also use that generative model as a language model. So, of course, if we have a joint distribution, P of X and Y, you can just sum out all of the possible values of Y that lead to that X, and this gives you a probability, and we can evaluate it in terms of perplexity or whatever else. Um, and so, again, that summation is a really, really hard thing to compute. There are a lot of possible parses that can be associated with a particular sentence, um, but we can approximate it and uh, it looks like we're getting a, uh, a really good, uh, very nice uh, perplexity uh, reduction on that. So this is some more evidence that the inductive biases are moving us uh, in, the, uh, in the right direction. Um, okay, so um, I think I'm going to skip this next section. Um, it, these, are gonna, these slides are in the notes. Uh, but basically, there's another version of dependency parsing where you're not building full uh, tree structures, but rather building things that look like uh, this thing with arrows where every word uh, points to the thing that it, uh, um, it points to the thing that it modifies. Uh, and there's another uh, similar sort of sequence of actions. So for those of you who are interested in changing problems that build complex structures into uh, sequences of actions, uh, th this deck of slides will give you kind of two examples of this. But I want to make sure we have time to kind of get through everything. This is pretty similar to the last section. Um, this is the model. Um, OK, now let's move away from sentences for a second and talk about words. Uh, because words are also, I think, a level of representation where we can uh, benefit from building a little bit of linguistic information. So um, words are kind of funny in language. They're quite different than sentences in a lot of ways. So um, I'd say there are kind of two um, contrasting elements in, in language. So the first is what's sometimes called arbitrariness. Um, and it just basically says that in general, there's no particular relationship between the way a word looks and the, what it means. So you can see this if you do kind of transformations on words. If you subtract the C and add a B to a word, you go from car to bar and you go from cat to bat. So same surface transformation, completely different meaning transformation, if you can even speak of that. Um, another way we see this is if you look at different languages, they use very, very different words to mean the same thing. So languages basically are unlimited in how they refer to things. So these are all the sort of, these are a bunch of words for cars. And car is a really recent concept. You might have think we all like, somebody invented it and we all started calling it the same word because we all, you know, it was invented once. But no, we still come up with a whole bunch of different words. Um, so, you might say, well, okay, I see, I was with you when you said you can compose parts of sentences together to get a meaning of a sentence. Is there something in words that we can compose together? Um, well, maybe. So, um, depending on the kind of words, kind of data source you're looking at, you might see that people aren't completely arbitrary. So the fact that you know cool with seven O's and you see cool with eight O's you probably know something about its meaning. You don't have to learn that from scratch. 
And then, of course, we've got morphology. So here we really do have compositionality in some sense. We have cat and we add s and we get this change in meaning from you know, one of them to many of them. And if we do the same thing with bat, we get the same transformation in meaning. And so that's a kind of regularity we might expect a good learner to be able to exploit uh, when we're computing representations of, of word meanings. So I think that there are opportunities here. Um, we can go further than this and we can actually use the fact that, um, so let's imagine we're going back to uh, word embedding. So we start off and we want to get a representation for a word. In most of the models we've been working with in this class, what we've done is we have said, well, we've got a big lookup table and all the columns in this matrix are associated with each word. And we'll learn each of those vectors as uh, parameters uh, in the model. And they're all going to be independent from each other. Um, so let's look at just one of these things. We can actually think about constructing this vector in a, in a different way so that rather than just as independent parameters, so that we maybe start sharing some information across uh, related forms. So we might do this as follows. We can say, well, we can just look this word up as a vector. So every word is special and has its own idiosyncratic meaning. So um, the difference in the meaning of the word uh, job versus jobs is not complete. Yeah, okay, it's, it is a plural, but when economists talk about the jobs report, there's not a sense in which they could also talk about the job report. Th those things are just different. So, you know, words are always idiosyncratic. Um, second, um, we can decompose this in terms of morphological analysis. So just like we can parse sentences into structures, you can often do the same thing with morphologically complex words. And I'm not going to talk about morphological parsing except to say that linguists have been at it again. They've done the exact same set of uh, tasks where they said, well, what's the internal structure of words? What do they have all sorts of diagnostics that correspond to human intuitions about these things, the intuitions of native speakers. Um, and we can get eat as something like eat plus singular third person uh, verb. And so we can imagine composing the sequence of morphemes into a representation of, so we'll have lookups for each of those and we'll compose them together. Now here you've st you're starting to get the ability to share some statistics. So if you go and look at the word like eating, it's going to share that same eat prefix. And so there will be some common, uh, common element there. And so we can just concatenate that uh, together. And so maybe there's also a third person. Um, so um, this can become the second part of our, our vector. And then finally, we might just say, well, what if we wanted to also be able to deal with the fact that maybe there are sometimes people spell eat with you know, 17 E's or something like that. Well, we can spell this, we can think of this as a, comp as a composition of a sequence of, uh, uh, of characters. And this gives rise uh, to uh, yet another vector. And so one way of constructing a vector that will share a little bit of information across related word forms is by concatenating uh, these three uh, representations. Um, so we can do the same thing. This is a way of conditioning on uh, a representation that's somewhat more linguistically sophisticated. We can also do the same thing uh, when we're generating uh, this, um, generating word forms uh, using a mixture model. Uh, so um, at every time step in, say, our RNN language model, or if we could use an RNNG, I guess, if we wanted, uh, we're going to sample a word uh, to, uh, to generate. And now what we're going to do is we're going to decide, well, let's split this into three different ways that we can generate the word. And the three ways are going to be, well, we can either just generate a word straight up from scratch if it's uh, in our vocabulary, or we can generate it as a sequence of morphemes. And then we're going to assume that off to the side we have somebody who knows we have this magic software component that given a word and a sequence of morphemes, it can stitch them together into a properly inflected surface form. And such tools exist. Um, or we can just spell a word out one character at a time. So these are going to be our three models, our three generation modes, words, morphemes, and characters. So we're going to first decide what's our mode. Then we'll decide, well, given that we're generating it as a word, what's the probability? Uh, we'll then generate the sequence of morphemes. Um, 
and then we'll generate the thing as a sequence of characters. Um, each of these things uh, generates the same word, uh, and they are um, mutually exclusive events. We have probabilities for them, so we have a joint distribution. We can marginalize them to get a final uh, probability distribution. So this is a kind of mixture model uh, where we're mixing several different modes of generation. Um, so this lets us build uh, models that uh, both represent and generate words in terms of their internal structure. Um, and this presumably has some, some <coughs> Um So if we see, uh, if we look at modeling some morphologically rich languages, I don't know if we have any Turkish or Finnish speakers in the room, they will tell you, yes, we have lots of words in our language. Um, so learning them from, trying to learn an embedding from scratch for every word in those languages, you need a lot of data. And uh, you do very, very badly if you don't deal with some of these things. Um, and so the columns are um, uh, basically going from left to right. Uh, how many modes do we, uh, do we have? So on the left, we just consider representing words using uh, characters. And then we use characters and morphemes, characters and words, and then finally all three. And we see that as we add sort of more linguistic knowledge to these things, uh, we do better and better. Um, which is, uh, which is nice. Um, okay, so enough about characters. So um, I will, I will wrap up the character section by saying this is particularly important if you're going to be working in languages other than English. So English is pretty convenient to just work with words. Or if you're working with user-generated data like Twitter or, you know, I don't know, other sort of online comment sections, things like that. Uh, it's really, really hard to sort of know what the short list of words is. Characters let you sidestep a lot of those issues. The models can also be a lot smaller, uh, need far fewer parameters, so that's, that's convenient. Um, okay, so for our last topic, um, I'm going to talk about a strategy for analyzing neural networks uh, in terms of linguistic concepts. I think this is, um, so as you go out into the world and work with neural networks, um, you're going to be asked by these sort of incredulous people you're trying to sell your stuff to, can we trust these things? They're black boxes. We don't know what's going on inside of them. Um, and learning how to interrogate the models and ask them what they're doing uh, in terms of traditional uh, analyses of the phenomena you're modeling is really uh, important. And so recently a paper came out that I thought did a, a really good job of this. Um, and uh, they were basically trying to answer this question. And they were looking at um, particularly what recurrent neural network language models are straight up RNN, sequential things. The thing that I just got done saying is bad inductive biases. Yes, but we know they're really good models. We know that in principle they can learn uh, things. The question is, are they learning things? Um, so they focused on one particular uh, bit, one particular phenomena, uh, phenomenon called uh, more subject verb agreement. You know, we all learned this uh, when we're, you know, in first grade or, uh, you know, learning English for the first time. So if you say the keys to the cabinet, um, you have to say R here because keys agrees with R. Um, and if you had said the key to the cabinet, uh, you would have to say is. So there's this agreement on first on present tense, um, uh, present tense verbs. Uh, between the, sub the number of the subject uh, and the form of the, form of the verb. Um, and what's interesting about this, what makes it diagnostic of syntactic knowledge, is if you have intervening nouns in the right configuration, those have to be ignored to a certain extent. You only are dependent on a certain noun that you're agreeing with. And you can certainly have embedded verbs that, that mean you should be, you can have multiple nouns, you don't always agree with the first one, you don't always agree with the last one. It really depends on the structure of the sentence. And so what we wanted to, what these guys wanted to do is answer the question, do neural networks learn these kinds of generalizations? And so, right, so this is the kind of thing that we want to figure out if they know, which we're not providing as, uh, as supervision. So their first experiment was uh, to look at can an RNN learn syntax uh, in principle. And so what they did here was they simplified this task 
quite a bit. So they actually got rid of all of those word predictions. They actually stopped doing a language model in tests. And they just said, well, whenever I'm going to predict a verb, instead I'm going to just predict a binary label that says singular or plural. Um, so in this sentence, you know, if it was keys, you would predict plural, and if it was key, you would predict uh, singular. And so here, you know, you might have this distractor now in the middle of cabinets, and then if the model learns to behave properly, you can say, well, this is basically all we're expecting this RNN to do is figure out syntax. And so this is going to kind of make it as likely as possible for the model to, to have succeeded. Um, one thing I'll say is this is a great setup. Um, to generate training data, you just need to be able to identify the present tense verbs in a corpus. You don't need to do any parsing. You don't need anything else. They used 1.4 million sentences from Wikipedia, so they have really thorough analysis. Um, now, to analyze, you might want a bit more information, so you need to know, uh, you know how many intervening nouns there are and what the structure of the sentence is. But to just train the thing, you kind of got very easily copious amounts of data. So that's a... Um, you know, I was, uh, when I read that, I was like, oh, another great idea. Um, okay, so how well does this work? So error rate, we see, um, well, for uh, the distance between the subject and the verb is up to 14 words. We can get some error bars on there, basically near 0%. The model just learns this really well, as long as there are no intervening nouns. Now, what about if there's the keys to the cabinet? That cabinet might confuse the model. That's a noun, right? Um, so even then, we see that the error rates are still pretty low. So the way to read this plot is if the subject is plural, what's the error rate? If there was no intervening noun, well, basically it's, you know, it's figured the rule out. Um, if the intervening noun also happened to be plural, well, then it just doesn't matter if maybe it got confused and was looking at the wrong one. It's just going to say plural um, still. But if the intervening noun was singular, then the error rate shoots up. But it doesn't actually shoot up that much. It shoots up to maybe 6%. And in fact, if you look at humans, we also make this mistake. We, we maybe make uh, errors in between 5 and 10%. So this looks actually really human -like. And you see the sort of same pattern for singular subjects and plural interveners. Um, so I'd say, yeah, well, you know, these are, these are the models of, uh, the, of human competence for language. Um, so they uh, ran a, a couple of other uh, experiments here where they showed that um, if you don't, if you leave out all the other uh, words in the sentence, so here, they, down here, this number prediction thing, that was the thing I was just showing. This is the keys to the cabinet, and then you predict plural or singular. Um, they have a baseline where they just include the nouns, and they throw out uh, anything that wasn't, uh, wasn't a noun. So basically, for that sentence, you just see keys, cabinet. And you see, in fact, in that sentence, the model just gets it does horribly. Um, in fact, it becomes completely uh, confused and does much worse than a, a random guess or majority or picking the majority class. Um, so you know, it really is uh, really is learning something, um, right? So this is this is nice. Um, all right. This isn't though a. This says that in principle, if you give the model exactly one task it is capable of learning this. And we kind of knew that. Now, can you learn this from a million sentences? Yeah, maybe we didn't know that, so we did establish that. Um, so they ran a series of other experiments, um, which I've kind of schematized here. Um, the first one is the one we just went through. Um, uh, the third one is a little bit interesting. It just reads an entire sentence and then says, was this sentence grammatical or ungrammatical? And the way they did that was they went and they flipped the, the, the sign of the verb, basically, from singular to plural, and then regenerated, they regenerated kind of a, a grammatical version, which was what it was ever in the training corpus, and then an ungrammatical version, and then said uh, that. Um, and then the final task is just language models. And the way they said, they, the way they wanted to ask uh, the model what it knows is they just said, well, what is, is the probability of the correct verb, the verb that I actually observe, 
in the training data more probable than the probability of the wrong verb in some sense. So in this sense, you'd expect that the probability of R is greater than the probability of it is. And so this is really asking the language model what it knows about the uh, about, um, morphological agreement. So we'll talk about that one here. Um, and here this curve looks uh, very different. So the language model, so down, down at the bottom, we have uh, basically uh, just this, the, the baseline we just talked about, also the grammaticality one. Basically, we're doing way better than majority class. We're, we're clearly learning with the supervision about grammaticality. We're learning uh, something about syntax. But the language model patterns much closer to the baseline of just using the sequence of nouns. And um, it's, uh, in fact, uh, the common nouns versus all nouns, that's just to leave out things like proper names. So it's clearly just getting confused and probably using the most recent noun to make the prediction of what the next, uh, of what the next uh, uh, thing is. So clearly, the language modeling objective isn't sufficient to learn uh, morphological agreement. So if you are, for example, designing a grammar checker and you want to you know, draw little squiggles under the uh, user's, uh, uh, user's text, you probably want to be a little careful in this case or you know, not harangue them too much because your model uh, might, might be getting these sorts of things wrong, at least if you just train it with, uh, with a language model. So I think this is a really nice uh, kind of analysis uh, to do. Um, so let me summarize this section, and actually I'm just coming now to the end of the lecture, um, so Phil has a few minutes. Um, I'd say RNN language models aren't learning the uh, uh, correct generalizations about syntax, and subject-verb agreement in English, this is about as simple as you can possibly hope to do, uh, where, because every sentence manifests this, or at least every sentence with a, a present tense verb, um, and that's, uh, that's a little bit disheartening. It does show that we've got you know, room to develop more interesting models. Um, there are some open questions. Um, one, I think, that's suggested by this is um, if RNNs were trained to jointly predict this singular plural decision as well as the next word, would they do better? Um, so certainly they would do better on the singular, uh, the singular task. Um, but would they also become a better language model? Um, and this is a really appealing idea, which is we would be left with a language model at the end of the day, but we would have trained it in a slightly different way. So we would have used more information at training time, but it would all be distilled into that neural network. So we could deploy it at test time and not worry about you know, doing all these auxiliary predictions. It would just be a better model. Um, so that's a, that's a really uh, interesting idea. Um, and then. We just talked about RNNGs. A good question would be, um, you know, they were designed to do well at something like this. Um, we don't actually, it would be nice to know. We should, uh, we should compare uh, the performance on this task. Um, some other experimental variants that should have been done that, uh, you know, if, you know, reading papers is an exercise and not only like learning from the, uh, from the results, but also thinking, you know, how would I have done this or, you know, what's the sort of follow-on work. Um, one thing you might expect is, so at every time step in a language model, um, what we also want to know is not just is the probability of the uh, correct word higher than the probability of the ungrammatical word, that seems sensible, um, but there might be some other confounds there. So a priori, certain words might not occur in plural form or in singular form, just in the corpus in any context. And these models are trying to match probability distributions, and they might be, they might be being led astray by these kind of global statistics. Um, and so really what we want to know is, is there some element in that hidden representation that is there information in that hidden representation that lets us say whether the word that's being predicted next is singular uh, and plural? And if you read the paper, they actually do some analysis of what individual uh, neurons are doing in these, uh, in these models, and they kind of find some evidence for this. Um, but one way you might do this is by training a second model 
uh, that's a classification function that takes as the input representation the hidden state when the verb is about to be generated and tries to predict singular flow. Can you learn that function? Does it generalize well to out of sample data? Um, you might also look for things like is there a single dimension corresponding to numbers? So in traditional linguistic theories, we actually do think that number is something that's being uh, tracked as part of our uh, um, you know, competence in English. So we might be able to, uh, we might be able to look for something like that. Um, so, you know, this is a new kind of uh, approach to analyzing neural networks. I think there's a lot of really interesting and exciting stuff uh, to be done there. Um, okay, so just to sort of conclude uh, this lecture, um, I'd say that linguistics uh, has two benefits. So, first of all, that you don't actually have to worry about linguistics. Um, too much, you can apply the techniques that we've uh, built. They make reasonable linguistic assumptions. Um, so RNNs are not terrible, uh, but linguistics can help you know where to look next uh, when you are trying to solve problems. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, people have spent a lot of time thinking about language and uh, they have some uh, actionable insights, I'd say. Um, the second thing is uh, what we ended here with, which is that they help us understand our models a little bit better. Very often, the only tool we have is accuracy or perplexity, and that's a really uninformative tool in a lot of cases. Uh, we saw at the beginning with recursive neural networks, if we just looked at overall accuracy, it looked like Naive Bayes was doing just fine. But in fact, we were systematically getting these negations of complex uh, uh, complex semantic structures completely wrong. And yes, these might be long tail phenomena, but to build systems that are really capable of understanding language, they need to be able to account, with, account for the long tail of linguistic uh, phenomena. So uh, that's about everything. Are there any questions? Or do you want to just interrogate Phil about what the exam's going to look like? Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, they do two things. One is a, sort of a smallish one on uh, Wikipedia, probably not the best language model, but then they take the world's biggest RNN language model, uh, this billion word language model that's trained by Google, which you can download, um, lowest perplexities, you know, ever recorded on that data set, okay. problems with the data set. But um, you can, uh, it's probably the best you could do so, and they found the same pattern of results. Do you have more information you could No, I mean, it's, um, it patterned exactly the same way as uh, the results that I showed. Um, so it didn't have any explicit, uh, it was just trained on the language modeling objectives. It was just predicting the next word. It didn't have, you know, it wasn't predicting singular or plural or anything. So, yeah. Even with a billion words, you're not learning. And a billion words is, you know, orders of magnitude more, or an order of magnitude more uh, words than you'd hear, you know, if you lived to 100 and talked a lot, listened a lot. All right, well thank you.